Hello and welcome to week 13 in artificial intelligence. This week we're going to be talking about natural language processing. This is an interesting topic because, and it's also very relevant, uh, and something that's, that's, again, relatively complex, but we'll try to go over it at a very high level so you at least have the concepts involved with NLP and can discuss it appropriately uh, and also know enough so that whenever you start to want to learn more, you know where to go look. Our agenda is very similar to what we do most days. Uh, we're going to go through the assignments, uh, and then we'll talk a little bit about Chapter 23, which centers on natural language processing. So jumping straight in to the assignments, uh, we're into kind of, like I said, week 13. We're halfway between 12 and 14. Nothing necessarily due right now, but you do have a natural language project coming up. So it's a good idea to probably be preparing for that uh, and, and laying the groundwork. Uh, for the discussion, uh, pick a topic out of the, the reading uh, and then try to describe it and define it using real world and common uh, language, not necessarily just something that's out of the text. So try to be able to explain it to someone as though you were explaining it to a layperson. Also talk about how it has a, a real world application. Maybe give an example of when you've either used or have been on the receiving end of natural language processing. Just to give you a little bit of a hint, you've uh, probably done so uh, more than you know. Uh, whenever you do something with perhaps a, a voice activated uh, personal assistant, you probably are dealing with some NLP at some le level. Granted, there's a lot of other stuff going on there as well. Uh, automatic speech, re speech recognition and a few other things. But after you do all that stuff, you typically do a certain amount of natural language processing, even if the processing is relatively restricted due to the grammars involved. So moving into chapter 23, uh, which again centers on natural language processing, there's kind of, um, when you talk about communication, there's kind of two distinct lines that you can view, and they kind of center around 1953. Uh, before 1953, there was a classical sort of view that basically viewed sentences as a series of true or false statements, basically centered on logic. Uh, after 53, we moved into it as more of a form of action so that it's about communicating with the intent of some form of action, be it persuasion. And most of this is centered around this, uh, the book of philosophical investigations. Uh, then since then, there's a few other kind of notable wor uh, works that have came along. So why do we talk? And, and generally speaking, it's in some fashion to impact or change the behavior of others whom we're speaking with be that a system, a, pr a process, or a person. So when we talk about speech, there's kind of a, some distinct phases that go on. A speaker will basically create utterances, and then the hearer is going to receive those utterances and then try to uh, process them and understand them using their own uh, mechanisms and capabilities. There's several goals that a speaker is often trying to accomplish. Uh, in this case, I'm informing, right? I'm I'm telling you things. I'm not necessarily trying to get you to do something. I'm not asking you a question. I'm not promising anything, certainly, but I am I'm basically informing you. Just as there's a pit in front of you, pretty good thing to know, right? Uh, a query is whenever I'm trying to elicit information, obviously. So, can you see the gold? Uh, what time is it? I'm asking a question with the in expectation of a response if it's a true query. Now, sometimes we may try to inform or to influence by asking a question, but that's kind of a different sort of case. There's also a command. The command is when you try to do something, you, you say something with the intent of some action occurring. Pick it up, stop what you're doing, uh, turn on the car, whatever those things might be. It's a command that expects the result of it to be after you've understood it and choose to do what it says, you essentially, uh, that's the intent is to make something occur. A promise is something like you would expect. I, I, I'll share the gold with you. Uh, if you do this, then I'll do that. Um, that's all oh, that's a conditional promise. Um, but it's basically an affirmation that something is going to occur. An acknowledgement is essentially just as the name implies, it's receipt of a message or confirmation of understanding. Um, so whenever you're doing speech and, and planning, uh, you need to know about the situation. Context is going to be very important. You also need to understand things like semantics and syntax and th that there's rules around both how you organize words together, how you use them, how words are pronounced and so on. Uh, there's also things you want to consider around what's the hearer's goals. 
uh, what do they know and are they rational or not? So these are all kind of important elements that go into the act of speaking just at a generic sense, ignoring computers for the moment. So drilling into just one of those types or, or intentions or forms of communication, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about informing. So uh, there's, it's about intention. That's one of the things is that the speaker wants to inform the hearer of something. Um, the, they essentially generate the words they're going to use. They say select the words they're going to use to do the communication uh, within the context that they're talking uh, to the person with the intent of communicating uh, the information they're trying to get across. Um, then they create those words and, and utter them, essentially. Uh, and oftentimes this may include a certain amount of noise, both in physical noise in the situation where the room, the conversation is occurring. So maybe you're in a noisy room. Uh, it may also be caused by either mispronunciation or mishearing. Sometimes there's noise on both sides. Uh, perception is that the hearer perceives something likely related to those words uh, in the context, uh, similar context from their perspective. Uh, and then they, they analyze those words, trying to figure out what it was they think the speaker might have been trying to get across. They come up with a, a set of possibilities. Uh, then they try to figure out which one of those is the most likely. Uh, we do all this subconsciously. We're not aware that we're doing this, but we do. That's where whenever you hear a word that doesn't seem to fit, you may not even be consciously aware and you hear the correct word. Uh, sometimes you'll hear that it's the wrong word, but you'll go ahead and accept the meaning because you, the, the probability is high enough that you are willing to go ahead and move forward, even though that runs the risk of miscommunication. And then incorporation is the kind of that last step of the communication where the hearer takes what it is that they've now learned from uh, the uh, the speaker, so that piece of information that was wanting to be shared, at least their version of it and incorporate it into what they know, so their knowledge base. So how can things go wrong? <laughs> There's all kinds of ways things can go wrong. First of all, uh, the speaker may not believe what they're saying, so they could be being insincere. They may be lying about what they're saying. Uh, the, the, there could be problem getting the, the conversation started could be the wrong words are selected. Uh, could be that there's ambiguity in what it is that the, the speaker chooses to use as the words to express their communication. Uh, and there may be different understandings of the context. So people see things from their own perspectives. So the context of the speaker may not be viewed as the same as the context of the hearer. While this isn't a, a history class, obviously, it is important to understand the, the material within the context of, of history. So if you go back way back to the 1950s, sort of a little bit of neural nets going on, kind of interesting enough, they go back that far. Uh, uh, and then you have regular expressions that go back that far as well, which is a really interesting sort of fact. Uh, then you move into um, uh, some rule-based semantics along the way. Uh, grep variation on uh, irregular expressions. So you basically were able to apply regular expressions to filtering through a file. Uh, some rule-based uh, machine translation. Uh, then we had search that became really popular in the mid 90s, some structured machine learning near the 2000. Uh, and then things really started getting interesting uh, uh, right around the the late 2010, right around that arena, whenever neural uh, automatic speech recognition started really taking off. Uh, then we had neural machine translation, uh, which is amazingly uh, precise. And then this concept of pre-training. We'll talk more about pre-training next week or the week after. I think it's next week. Uh, but the basic idea here is that creating a training set to do machine learning and to, uh, to do natural language processing with machine deep learning and neural networks is, is difficult. It's difficult for lots of reasons. One of the main reasons though, is that it's hard to come up with good data. Uh, you need clean training data to do accurate uh, natural language processing. Uh, you need uh, parts of speech to be labeled um, if you're doing NLP. Uh, and so on. So if you're doing ASR, automatic speech recognition, you may not necessarily need to know parts of speech. It's about converting from utterances into words, uh, but not necessarily making sense of those words. When you move into natural language processing, it's about turning those words into something that may make sense and have meaning. In order to do that, you need to know about those words. To do that, you oftentimes have to pre-train the models. And the idea there is that you get a model that is of a reasonable amount of, um, of accuracy 
And then you do something like transfer learning on top of that to, to customize it to a particular corpus so that that corpus then can be done more accurately and with a higher uh, level of, of accuracy and quality within that domain uh, of a specific domain rather than just a general corpus. So the fields that are related to natural language processing, uh, th three top level ones that come to mind, uh, computational linguistics, this is around using computational methods uh, to know how language works. Uh, cognitive sciences, trying to figure out how the brain works is kind of an important thing. Not that we necessarily have to make things work the way it works, but, but sometimes by understanding how it works, we can then make systems that work in a similar way or perhaps accomplish the same sort of thing. Speech processing, turning audio signals into text. That's where this automatic speech recognition comes to play. The idea is that you take essentially a waveform, an audio uh, stream, often in a wave file, and convert that into text. Once you've got it into text, uh, then you're gonna wanna turn that into something that has meaning and language. So you go from essentially an acoustic model where you're taking sounds and such, turning it into essentially ideally words, and then you go from words into a language. So uh, potentially applying, going from, from phenomes, uh, phonetic sort of uh, characteristics into actual textual words. I briefly mentioned language models uh, previously. Uh, that's where we are taking something from essentially a, 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 either a series of, of uh, phonetic representations of, of uh, utterances uh, or perhaps even words, but then figuring out how those things work together. It's very much goes back to things such as nouns and verbs and all the good stuff that you probably really loved doing back in school where you would diagram sentences, assuming they still diagram sentences. But the basic idea here is that sometimes you need to understand the linguistic structure of, of uh, a series of words in order to um, uh, essentially interpret it in some meaningful way. As you can see here, the example on the screen has a, one of these cases of a certain amount of um, uh, ambiguity and perhaps purposeful fun uh, and the same thing with some of these others teacher strikes idle kids uh, teacher strikes idle kids and that's basically could be interpreted that a um, the teacher hit a kid that was idle or the teacher goes on strike or a series of teachers goes on strike so the kids are now not going to classes uh, and we also have words of both body position uh, uh, body versus weapon right so arms it could be either a body or it could be a weapon and head could be uh, a position within an organization or it could be part of a body as well so some of these things have a certain amount of ambiguity that has to be taken into consideration as computer science students i'm sure you're familiar with the term syntax it's something that uh, should have been covered quite thoroughly in your previous years of, of study uh, we also have syntax inside of language. There's a, a, a legal way to hook things together, uh, and that's where you can, uh, even tools can now, such as Grammarly, can actually help you by identifying whenever you're essentially breaking those kinds of rules. What you see on the screen is a syntactic breakdown of the paragraph that you can see most of that's showing basically the subject, the verbs, and all that good stuff uh, broken down by the organization uh, and with uh, parts of speech labeling going on so that you can see how things are organized into essentially a syntactic tree. This is something that goes into the concepts associated with natural language processing and, and again is quite relevant. A grammar is also going to be something that, that you need to know about and it kind of ties in to some uh, some amount with syntax, right? Uh, and the basically idea is it's kind of another step up where you're talking about the, the compositional structure of complex messages. Uh, and it's also potentially a formal language. So again, you have the, the kind of overloaded word of grammar. Grammar can be both the grammatical structure inside of the English language, but it can also be, in this case, you're looking at a certain type of of uh, uh, implication being written as a grammar uh, uh, with uh, essentially a formalized language or a specialized language associated with strings. So it's, it's a way of also representing data or representing textual information uh, so that you can then understand it is the intent. There's lots of different types of grammar. Here are three to four of the most common ones. Uh, you, you probably have heard of context-free grammars. Uh, that's, a, that's an expression that you'll hear. You probably also heard of clean, uh, as in clean closure. Uh, don't really have to worry about it too much for this course, but just understanding that there are different types of grammars uh, and you might encounter different types depending upon uh, what you're wanting to do. Uh, true natural language uh, is pretty much context-free. 
uh, and it is potentially making that's part of what makes it so challenging. One of the other expressions that you're probably going to hear about is a bag of words. Uh, a bag of words kind of is it's it's kind of a not a great word because uh, uh but it, the terminology what it's implying is essentially a dictionary uh, containing uh, the keys being the words that are in a collection of text and the values being the number of times they occur. So you can see that over here on the right side uh, that there is, uh, th these are the list of words that occur uh, and the, the count. Uh, if you're familiar with Hadoop and MapReduce, one of the common uh, examples you'll see in that domain is uh, word count. Uh, it's exactly constructing this. It's constructing a bag of words in a distributed fashion, processing a text file. These become important whenever we start doing certain types of analytics. Uh, it gives you, first of all, a sense of uh, the things that are going on inside of the words, but then you also kind of extend this typically to do things like considering how close words are together and potentially even moving into the realm of uh, grams, such as n-grams, where you have uh, a certain number of words within essentially two or three or four, or how many ever n is a, a pattern of those words, and you count those as well. A thing that we have to do quite a bit inside of, of any kind of analytic sort of uh, uh, environment or, or domain, uh, including artificial intelligence and including natural language processing, is to be able to, to quantify how well we're doing. Uh, that's where this grammatical or, or grammatically uh, judgments uh, comes to, to play. And you basically, if you're considering uh, false uh, statements, there are false positives, there's false negatives, and there, there are false things that it should be false, right? And you want to obviously try to maximize that domain between the two. Uh, so when you have a formal language, L sub 1, uh, and it differs from the natural language, L sub 2, the thing that you're actually trying to model, then you can view adjusting L sub 1 so that it matches L sub 2 to be a learning problem. And so that's one of the things that we, we try to do is make things uh, better. Uh, the challenge you have, though, is that when you try to use um, real grammars, uh, grammatical rules, if you will, it doesn't work out terribly well because the English language is very complex and language in general is very complex, partly because people are in the mix and people have a tendency to, you know, do things like create new words, borrow words from other languages, borrow expressions from other languages, mispronounce things, change the meaning of things and so on. So it becomes a very challenging problem. But it's important to be able to, in general, quantify how well something is doing by considering false positives, false negatives, and those things that are truly being categorized correctly. Another area related to natural language processing is parsing. The idea of parsing is you're going to convert something from a textual representation into something more usable. Oftentimes, we call it a parse tree, uh, perhaps a bit of a, a, a cyclic sort of definition or recursive definition that a parser creates as a parse tree, and a parse tree is something used that is produced by a parser. But the ba basic idea here is turning things into uh, a structure that is usable uh, programmatically. So if you consider uh, this parse tree, uh, it's basically showing, again, uh, the breakdown uh, across uh, parts of speech of a sentence, right, based upon subject, verbs, and so on. Uh, and so that's one of the things that we often do is be able to parse it. Uh, and there's lots of different ways of doing that parsing. Uh, the syntax uh, has a lot of challenges because the syntactic structure uh, is complex. Mary hits uh, hit John is not the same thing as John hit Mary, so it's not a, a reflective sort of thing. Uh, and there's lots of challenges uh, between where uh, how we break up things, where the pauses are, and even if things are perfectly well uh, written, there's still some ambiguity, and it makes it very challenging whenever we try to do things uh, applying s syntax to natural language processing. Uh, and this is where uh, context-free uh, parsing comes in. Uh, typically, it's about trying to do some sort of bottom-up parsing and replacing substrings with matches of the right-hand side of the rules and so on. Um, again, very complex, very challenging. Uh, and it's important, though, to understand the concept of a context-free parser, that it is a type of parser. Obviously, context-free kind of gives you an indication that it, it is uh, uh, does not depend upon the context in which it's being utilized and so on. Drilling in a little bit more around the complex complications and the complexities associated with natural language processing uh, and natural language in general. So um, 
there's lots of problems and here's pretty much a list of them. We'll go through each one of these in a greater detail, but real human language is very challenging for natural language processing of using programs to process language. These are the classifications, at least some of the things that are problematic. Moving into ambiguity, uh, the squad helps dog bite victim. So are they helping the dog bite the victim or, or are they helping the person who was bit? We can kind of in inherently know that. But the basic idea though is that it can be very ambiguous and things can change a lot depending upon, in this case, one or two words at the end. So if you look at I ate spaghetti with meatballs, okay, I ate spaghetti with salad. Uh, it's changing the nature of a, it's spaghetti with meatballs, a type of dish that includes the, the ingredients essentially, to uh, two different dishes that are being served at the same time. To if you talk about abandon, I ate spaghetti with abandon. It switches from not that you're eating it, it's how you're eating it, not what you're eating or how what you're eating it with. Uh, or a fork, the mechanism of eating it, not just how you're eating it from a, a stylistic perspective, but also what mechanism are you utilizing. And then a friend is within the context. So minor changes can significantly change the meanings uh, of the sentence. Another challenge is anaphora. So the idea here is that we often use shortcuts whenever we're, we're communicating, because if we don't, then the language becomes very cumbersome. So after Mary proposed to John, they, um, so that's uh, Mary and John, we assume, found a preacher and got married. So rather than saying after Mary and John, or Mary proposed to John, Mary and John found a preacher, we use they as a shortcut. But knowing who they is can get uh, challenging, especially because it can span great distances within the text. Uh, for the honeymoon, they went to a Hawaii. We assume based that, that because of our norms, generally speaking, it's probably Mary and John that went on the honeymoon, not Mary, John, and the preacher, because it, it could have went the other way, right? Um, Mary saw a ring through the window and asked John for it, it being the ring. Uh, Mary threw a rock at the window and broke it, and we assume it is the window. Uh, not the ring. So uh, the point of this is that uh, the, these sort of short-term uh, shortcuts in our language can be very challenging for a program to address. We also consider kind of where what something is referring to based upon its situation, a place, a time. I am over here. Over here, it depends upon when I set it, right? So if I say I'm over here and I maybe I send you a text message with that, uh, that here is relevant at the moment that I send it, but it doesn't really convey much information. And what, why did you do that? I'm asking you, the receiver of the message, I'm not saying your name, uh, and so on. So it's basically, it depends upon place, time, and who's being communicated. So it's all about the context in those sort of words. So that means in order to understand that and to be able to identify what those things mean, you're going to need to understand uh, kind of the context of the conversation. Um, we also use uh, one expression to kind of stand in for another. Uh, Chrysler announced record profits. Uh, it's Chrysler Motor Corp, most likely, or whatever they're called today. Uh, I've read Shakespeare. Uh, you didn't actually read him because, you know, if, it's, if we're somewhere talking about the person, he's a book. He's not a book. He doesn't have words written on him, but you've read his works. So it's I've read the works of Shakespeare is, is what we're doing, but we're using it as an abbreviation. The ham sandwich on table four wants another beer. Uh, referring to the person by what they ordered, uh, rather than uh, the customer who ordered the ham sandwich on table four wants another beer, it would be the longer version of it. But the receiver of that information knows what it means, and that's kind of the intent. The metaphor is like the non-literal uh, use of a word. Uh, so I've tried killing the process, but it won't die. Uh, its parent keeps it alive. So. Uh, it, you're not actually out there trying to attempt murder, rather you're trying to terminate a process uh, and because of a, a parent process is keeping the child process alive, you can't determinate it. So uh, it's, uh, it's using it as a metaphor to where if you take it literally, uh, it's, it's more troubling and concerning and that's a, we very much speak in metaphor a lot of the time. So you can't, uh, or when you comp comp non compose uh, composite compositionality. Um, when you combine things together, they can oftentimes take on very different meanings. Uh, red book versus red pencil versus red hair versus red herring. Uh, you can't just stick them together and think it's going to work out. It's very complex and it's again probably going to be based upon this the placement inside of uh, the 
the the sentence, the context, and various other situations. So uh, the types of shoes, basketball shoes, okay, that's a type of shoe, baby shoe, uh, alligator shoe, designer shoe, and brake shoe, very different sort of things. So you can't just assume that they're all something that goes on your feet. Uh, and even those things that do go on your, your feet, they're, it's a mixture of class of shoe versus use of shoe versus who's going to wear the shoe uh, and, and even what the shoe is made of. So what's the point of natural language processing? What do we try to accomplish? What are the tasks that we try to accomplish when we're doing natural language processing? So uh, asking why is always a great question, something I try to do pretty much all of the time. Uh, speech systems are a good example. Uh, I've mentioned previously uh, during this conversation, automatic speech recognition, ASR. Uh, the basic idea is you put text in or audio in and you get text out. Uh, so the the basic idea here is uh it's it's very um it's potentially very challenging uh you can whenever the the reference here of microsoft speeching me reaching human parity uh with speech recognition system that's using a certain particular or a certain uh, corpus, uh, the switchboard corpus, which is a relatively low fidelity uh, sort of um, data set based upon recordings of switchboard and, and reaching human parity is reaching the same error rate as a human uses. Um, so the 1% the error for digit strings, we're pretty good at that. That's why you can talk to your phone uh, and tell it your, your credit card number over the phone and it gets it right most of the time. Uh, conversational speech, uh, uh, it's it does pretty good. Uh, you get a potentially a five percent error rate uh, with conversational speech. Uh, that means you're getting roughly ninety five percent, and that that five percent is probably a five percent word error rate. That's a bit more of a complex metric, but still pretty impressive. Uh, uh, and with uh, twenty percent hard acoustics. Um, it's acoustics can make it very challenging because you can have echoes, you can have various different sounds that very much change the experience uh, and the meaning of those words or the ability to interpret the correct word based upon uh, the acoustic model. Text to speech is basically you put text in and you get audio out. Uh, it's uh, it can do it pretty well. Uh, it's actually getting to the place now where it's becoming more challenging to tell a machine versus a person. There was a time it was really very clear. Uh, the, the phonetic uh, pronunciations were pretty poor uh, and so on. But it's now getting with um, the, the phenome approach and so on. Uh, things like uh, Siri, uh, Google uh, Home, uh, Google Assistants and so on are all doing very well being able to both understand what we're saying to them, do some stuff in, after the fact, and then tell us what the outcome was. So pretty impressive progress. Machine translation is also a pretty uh, compelling use of uh, the, the natural language processing. The basic idea here is to take one expression in one language and convert it into another language primarily so that the, the reader or speak or understanding of one language can understand others. Uh, and it's basically being done through uh, a type of, of mapping. And it's not as simple as word to word mapping because uh, there's there's lots of situations where even the ordering of words is quite different from language to language. Uh, we'll talk about this again uh, in a, a subsequent lecture a bit more. But the key takeaway here is that it does it really quickly and it does it very well. Uh, part of the reason that this turned out to be the case, Google spent a fair amount of time uh, scanning a whole bunch of books and a lot of them were in different languages. And they did so for several purposes, but it definitely helped with the translation. They were able to create a very large corpus of, of documents and be able to correspond what exact um, portions of those documents corresponded and then figured out ways to map between the two so they could then create models that allowed them to do machine translation very quickly. Related to uh, the, the language translation or the written translation is spoken language translation. Uh, near real time, uh, you can now uh, translate, uh, and the example here is through Skype, from one language to another uh, in near real time. So you can speak to someone uh, in uh, a, a different language than you speak. And, and there's even apps on your phone that let you do this now, so that if you're traveling to another country and you don't speak the language in that country, rather than having some sort of translation book of, of spoken phrases and trying to pronounce things and so on, you can basically talk to your phone and then it plays back the appropriate thing in the other language. All of these things may have a little bit of a 
uh, uh, artificial sound to them when you hear them, and it may be kind of difficult to understand, perhaps. But you can typically, they're good enough. Uh, they're good enough for most people to use as a mechanism, uh, certainly in that situation where you're traveling abroad. They're also good enough that if both of the parties are are willing to, ex, you know, get around any kind of hiccups that might be in the communication channel. And if you think about it, it would be nothing more than a little bit more of an interference in the communication process we talked about early on. It's just that there's some some pretty amazing stuff going on in between those boxes where it's actually going from one language to another language and then it's being received by the receiver or the hearer in that language. So uh, pretty cool stuff. But as long as people are willing to work around the noise that's introduced, quite useful. Summarization is also a key concept uh, in natural language processing doing a pretty good job at this. If you go and search on Google uh, and give it a query, oftentimes it will return back to you the parts of that document that are the most relevant to what you're trying to find, to, almost to the point of being able to answer your question. If you ask a question like, how long do I grill a steak uh, to get it to medium uh, well done, uh, you'll get back a result that probably will tell you. Um, uh, more importantly, it'll highlight the section of a document that you can click on and go to to see. So it does a mixture of, of summarization and also finding answers inside of it. Uh, being able to read a large, uh, like a news story and be able to summarize it very quickly is a quite compelling thing. Uh, it, it also can help identify uh, the elements that are the most important. And with that, uh, we've reached the end of the conversation. As always, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to me. That's what I'm here for. Stay safe, and we will talk again next week.